Dr. Graney was my anatomy professor in my second year of medical school. And if you all think back to your training, whatever it happened to be in, in a teacher who touched you deeply with their passion for their subject and their expertise of their subject, that would be Dr. Graney. I asked him just a few years ago, I said, because I was trying to review anatomy, believe it or not, and I, I asked Dr. Graney, what book would you recommend? And he said, well, if I were stuck on a desert island, and then he went in, and I forgot the book that he recommended, but then I said, Dr. Graney, you know, a lot of people stuck on a desert island would want the Bible and would want Shakespeare and maybe a great Steinbeck novel, but here's a man who's lived and breathed anatomy all of his adult life, and if he's on a desert island, he still wants an anatomy book. So I, I don't know what else to tell you about him. He's won every teaching award that this institution has to offer. As a matter of fact, he's won them so often that he can't win them anymore. And, and they give you this chair when you've won the fourth one, I think. And on the, on the chair is a little plaque. And in fine print at the bottom of the plaque, it says, give someone else a chance, for Christ's sake. <laughs> but, <laughs> Uh, he's been here a long time. He's educated all of us. He's a gift to the University of Washington and the community. Uh, Dr. Graney. Thank you. Uh, I've been um, uh, intrigued by uh, this evening, and uh, certainly I've had a chance to uh, be here before We're doing the anatomy labs. This is my first time to be here uh, in the evening, so I want to thank all of the the, uh, the sponsors of this uh, program for inviting me here to uh, present to you tonight. Uh, it was interesting to me to hear Dr. Reyes speak because uh, basically it was my life in terms of where medicine has gone. Um, I started graduate school in the late 50s and I was a graduate student at the University of California uh, even back in the late 50s, 59. I met my wife who was a nurse at University a Hospital there, Moffitt Hospital. And uh, it turned out shortly after we were married she was invited to be a charter nurse in the intensive care unit there. And so many of the transplant things, the initial kidney transplants done at Moffitt Hospital, my wife was a part of there when Dr. Najarian was doing those uh, transplants and later went on to the University of Minnesota. Um, you heard about the, the sort of experimental procedures that were done and how often, you know, things succeeded, but many times they didn't. And I can't count the number of times that I would meet my wife at the end of a shift and she'd be in tears because they'd just lost another patient uh, from a transplant or a patient who had the, uh, couldn't get kidney transplant or kidney uh, dialysis because they didn't have dialysis in those days. So many, many things have changed. And as I look over the 50 some odd years of my being around medicine, I'm not an MD, I'm a PhD, which doesn't mean phony doctor, it means a doctor of philosophy, <laughs> all right? And so, um, uh, I do not have clinical experience, but I've been around a lot of folks who have a lot of clinical experience, and some of it has rubbed off. So I'm supposed to talk about two things tonight. Uh, first of all, I was going to talk about the body, uh, the Will Body Program, and um, then I was told, well, yes, but you know, many of you who are here have been trying to get into the anatomy labs and have not succeeded, so I should say something about anatomy. So this is kind of uh, two sides of the fence. I will give. Uh, the Will Body program uh, some time, but it will be brief, and I will move on to talk about some anatomy. I've chosen to talk about head trauma tonight because it's sort of not only some anatomy, it's a little detailed, and I will be on full jet takeoff here with, when I start moving, as I told some of the others. My, I'm infamous for speaking way too fast, all right, but given the time and so forth, we will move along. Uh, so uh, I'll, let me start with the donations. Uh, I have been involved in the Will Body program uh, quite frankly, from the very first day I came here. All of us as gross anatomists helped to uh, take call in evenings and weekends when somebody had passed away to review their case to see whether or not we could utilize their remains uh, in our anatomy programs. So um, I wasn't here in 1945, as this shows up here, uh, but the Will Body program was in existence here even before the medical school began. There was a small program here in Allied Health, and cadavers were used for that. Donations are arranged by individual donors before death or by the family after death. Many people think they have to sign up ahead of time. We prefer that because it gives everybody in the family and the donor all the information they need to know, but um, uh, when it happens afterwards, sometimes the next of kin are not fully aware of everything and, and we have to take more time to make sure that everybody understands exactly what the implications of the donation are. Uh, are there fringe benefits? There are no charges for transportation of the remains from the place of death to the university if it's in the local area. And that local area will, will sort of expand or contract depending upon our particular needs here at the university at this time. Uh, we have our own crematory here. 
In 1995, we opened a new morgue area facility for the receiving of all of the donations that come here. Uh, Two million point something was spent on this morgue area that we have, uh, along with a crematory. So we do our own cremations, everything from the time the body is received through the labs here until the body is cremated, and then the cremated remains may or may not be returned to the families depending upon their particular interest. We have an annual burial at Evergreen Washelli each year where cremated remains are buried and uh, family members are invited to attend if the, their remains are buried there. Uh, other families will choose to take the cremated remains to a private place and uh, uh, have them uh, interred at that site. Cadavers are used in the teaching of all the health science programs, including, as you can see here, dentistry, medicine, nursing, occupational, physical therapy, and pharmacy. Uh, not everybody dissects, uh, but some people use uh, prosections. Uh, where, and what a prosection is means it's already dissected and you have a chance to see it and to review uh, the anatomy in some organized fashion, depending upon what kind of a course it is. Despite prophecies to the contrary, the cadaver persists as the principal tool of anatomical teaching. That means we don't see in the immediate future computers being a means by which uh, uh, anatomy can be taught. It can be enhanced. Uh, surgery is now being done with a lot of computer-assisted uh, techniques, uh, but certainly uh, we still believe that the cadaver is going to be a primary source. I am constantly besieged by surgeons who want to come back to a cadaver lab to work with a body for one particular surgical reason or another. It continues to be uh, the paramount source of anatomy. Unlike the history that Dr. Ray has, uh, has talked to you about over the last uh, 50 years, we haven't changed the model. So all bodies are pretty much the same. And that makes it much easier for the surgeons. So it's difficult enough, but this makes it easy. There's no new models each year. <laughs> so um, now I have a little thing that I always talk about. I mentioned it to the last group. No student is allowed to dissect good any cadaver laying on a table. However, all students are encouraged to dissect well the cadaver lying on the table. All right, a little bit of English. <laughs> In medicine, we never say die. It's always dissect. Radiologists do not inject dye. They inject contrast material. There's only maybe one dye that's used around the eye, fluorescein dye, but outside of that, we do not use dyes. One of the problems that we have, and you've heard now the need for organ donations, is that one difficulty has occurred with a number of people who are uh, really criminal in their intent in using organs for transplant or for uh, harvesting tissues for other types of implant into patients. That has created a lot of negative press for some of our medical schools and our hospitals around this country. For a while, uh, I was beginning to think that it was going to impact significantly on our Will Body program. I'm pleased to say that um, if I look at what's happened in the last week, we are doing very well. Uh, we are going to continue to need about 200 bodies a year at this university to maintain our educational programs. If for some reason something happens and people stop giving their bodies to medical schools, and by medical schools I mean health science centers, because these bodies are used by all the participants here in this health science center, uh, that uh, we would be in deep trouble in terms of our educational programs. We could not survive in terms of the teaching that we need to do here without uh, these such donations. Now, are we in competition with organ uh, donor transplant? We are not really because most of our donors are pretty much beyond the age of being an organ donor. So we have donors from 70, I think I saw one in the lab the other day who was 105, all right? Age is not an issue for us uh, because uh, we are able to make use of the remains in a variety of ways, uh, even if it's only for simply educational purposes. So uh, I'm hoping that nothing is going to change and that we're able to maintain a good rapport with the public. Our program exists on the altruism of all of you. Without your altruism, we would not have bodies here. The bodies that we have upstairs in the lab are donated to us. All of ours come from people who've signed papers or their families have signed papers and uh, we were able then to utilize the remains. I can say more about it and if there's some questions at the end, I would be happy to, uh, to, to uh, answer those questions. But uh, let me just say that this is a vital program and it's not just here for the University of Washington. I would uh, point out that, uh, as you've already heard, there's a whammy program, now a wah-whammy. I like to call it Washington whammy. 
which is Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho, because Washington started the program. Uh, we, we basically service over somewhere between 35 and 40 percent of the United States uh, geography. The landmass of the United States, 35 to 40 percent is whammy territories. Uh, we have one medical school for all of that. That's this institution right here. We have students in Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho in their first year, but then they come here later. And uh, so we are the principal side of all of this. We do provide a few bodies for Alaska and uh, some for uh, Idaho uh, and Washington State University. God forbid I should say that because sure enough, there's going to be a husky who says, please do not send me to that <laughs> land of the cougars. <laughs> we'll do the best to, to uh, take care of any of your special needs. <laughs> I really want to move ahead because I would like to say something. I mentioned to you that I have a PhD. I'm not an anatomist, but I've learned a lot from some of my clinical colleagues. And I try to bring clinical uh, issues to this, my teaching. And one of them has to do with head trauma. And one of my neurosurgeon friends who came and talked to my class before we started reducing the hours, and he got so busy doing a number of other things, uh, that he would always present this slide. He said, when you have a patient who's been traumatized, the things that you're looking for is their level of consciousness. Obviously, if they're unconscious, there's a problem. Um, if they're hemi is there hemiparesis? That means, are they paralyzed on one side or maybe both sides? Are there eye signs? You hear about this all the time in ER. Those of you who watch these medical programs, fixed dilated pupils, that's bad, right? The vital signs. What's the blood pressure doing? What's the pulse rate, uh, et cetera, cardiac rate? Uh, and then, of course, the very end stage, which is death. So this certain neurosurgeon would say, look, I want you to know all of this because if you are the uh, healthcare person who calls me when the vital signs change, I will get to the hospital in time to pronounce the patient dead, all right? I can't do anything when it gets to that point. The patient is already so uptended in terms of their neurology uh, that they cannot recover. So these first three, thing, first three things are very important. So I have kind of brought this to a lot of my teaching. So here we go, Anatomy 101 in 20 minutes. <laughs> we all know there's a brain and a spinal cord. Uh, the terminology that we often use is the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system are the nerves that are out there in your arms and your legs. The central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord. You know where the brain is. You know there's a spinal cord inside the vertebral column. Spinal nerves pass out to supply all the muscles and supply the skin. These uh, parts of the central nervous system, whether it's the spinal cord or the brain, have coverings. And some of you have heard that these coverings are called the meninges. And when the meninges are infected, we call it meningitis. So uh, the meninges are composed of three things. The dura, which is the tough mother. Some of us are raised by a dura pater. Uh, <laughs> but in any event, uh, that's the thick layer. There's also a spidery layer, which is the arachnoid. You remember your zoology. The spiders were the arachnids, all right? So there's a thin layer. And then finally, there is the pia mater, which is the very thin, delicate layer that overlies the brain or the spinal cord. You can't separate it. You can't pull it up and hold it in your fingers. You can pull up the arachnoid, and you can pull up the dura. So here, when you look in at a, a little more detail of a, of a spinal nerve, you can see the dura that surrounds it, all right, uh, and the arachnoid is underneath it. I will show you in a moment when we get up inside the skull that there's also something that separates the arachnoid from the spinal cord or from the brain. The arachnoid is elevated away because there's a fluid layer there. There is the cerebral spinal fluid. And so the brain and spinal cord are bathed in a fluid that runs all the way from inside the skull down to the very bottom part of your uh, spinal cord. When you look at the spinal cord, it looks like a little white thing, all right? If you look more carefully, you will notice that the outside layer is more white, so that's what you're seeing in these lower pictures over here. The center part is, is gray. Gray means there's cells there, neurons. A neuron is a, is a cell that's specialized for neural activity. The white part is a fiber tracts. So if any of you, the men may be here, bend down to your entrance panel and looked at your entrance panel, you know there are good ones and there are bad ones. And the bad ones are where wires are going every which way. And the good ones are when they're all lined up and carefully bundled so that all of them are in nice, neat order. The spinal cord is the latter. All the nerve fibers are bundled in very good order and sorted out in terms of function. So what that means is, that's the good part. The bad part means is that sometimes if you have an injury, you have a major injury because all those nerves are having a similar function, and when you wipe that out, you wipe out a significant part of the function. So here, for instance, now is the 
brain up above. Here are some tracks that are going down to the spinal cord going out. This happens to be a motor tract. This little guy up here that looks kind of disproportionate is a homunculus. A homunculus is designed to show the amount of cortex uh, dedicated to a particular function. So you notice how your face and your hands and even your toes have a lot of cortex because these are dexterous portions. Your lips are very sensitive. Your face skin is very sensitive. So you have a lot of cortex devoted to that for either motor or sensory function. Another little thing here, when you look at when the brain comes down and it sends these uh, fibers down through a basal portion of the brain, this little V over here, that little V is called the internal capsule. The internal capsule is a space where all these motor fibers make their way down or go back up because obviously you've got motor down and sensory returning. It comes through this and you can see how this is all mapped out over here. Why am I talking about that? Because the internal capsule is an area where strokes occur sometimes, where bleeding occurs. That means the cells that are in this area, the fibers that are in this area, will be deprived of blood and therefore this will mean a significant uh, deficit for the patient uh, following that stroke phenomenon. Now, uh, how can you tell whether there's been some damage to the spinal cord? Well, in this case, you can't tell unless the patient has died and you've now taken out the spinal cord. And when you look at this, it's backwards. Remember I said this was the gray and that was the white? Why is that white? Well, we stained it with silver. That makes it go black. If there are viable uh, fiber tracks there, because of the myelin, the fatty layer there, that will pick up the stain and the, the silver will turn it black. These areas are white. That means those are degenerating neurons. Now, these are names here, for instance, for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Here you see the areas of degeneration. Here is another one where you see this combined sclerosis. All this white area means that these patients have lost significant fiber tracts, which in, in some of these cases have been related either to the motor function or to their sensory function. And so when they're trying to walk, they walk like they're drunk because they can't actually feel where their heel strikes, uh, their skin and uh, joints are not proprioceptive anymore. They can't sense that bit of balance that they need to be able to progress in a natural way. Uh, and this is a problem because sometimes people interpret their disabilities, you know, he, oh, there's a goes another drunk down the street or whatever, just like diabetics who have the, their problems and become sort of non-functional for a period of time. Uh, it's important that they wear bracelets and so that the people can identify the fact that they have a, a problem. All right, well, now let's go up into the skull. Here it is, the skull. <laughs> Lots of bones, 22 bones. Never asked that of a, of a medical student. Uh, it's hard, all right, unless you're a baby. And then the skull is soft. And it's not all hard bones all locked together like they are in us hard-headed old guys, okay? And the soft heads move, all right? They flex, and when the mom gives birth, the head adapts to the birth canal, and things work out well for everybody. <laughs> if you've been ever feeding a, a, a baby a bottle, all right, and you look down, the head bounces up here, all right, it's because there's a pressure change. What pressure is that? Well, it's the central, it's the cerebral spinal fluid. There's fluid there that's in communication with all the, the blood vessels basically around that, and since there's a venous drainage of the brain, and all this goes back to your chest, as your chest pressure changes, it actually is reflected through your veins up into the skull, and therefore you can actually see uh, different uh, pulsatile effects of all this physiology as it goes on. Now, here's another case of a skull, which is in two pieces. I first saw this in a book some years ago, and they said the pink part is the neurocranium because it contains the brain. The green part is your face, so we call it the visceral cranium because that's where you put the food. And I thought, gee, that's that's an awful lot of energy just to sort of separate it until I got around some plastic surgeons and found out that this is also what's called a Lefort three mid-face fracture. People have this happen to them, all right? And uh, for a long time, this was a disastrous uh, event because the whole face would elongate as your whole jaw and so forth separated from the side. Uh, as you can see here, now obviously you still have skin and tissue there, so it doesn't quite uh, separate as much as you're seeing in this picture. But uh, one of the marvels of surgery nowadays is, is that uh, we, first of all, develop better anesthetic skills and better uh, ER skills so that we can now operate on these patients sooner rather than later. In the old days, you had to wait for these patients to stabilize. By that time, their fractures had healed. And now trying to fix these things were great difficulties. You'd have to cut bones and try to put everything back together again. And these days, with all the fancy hardware that they have, 
plates of all sorts of shapes, straight ones, Ys, Ls, all kinds of things with screws, screws that are multi-dollars per screw, okay, and multi-dollars per plate. The hardware industry is very big, all right? I'm not talking about Home Depot, all right? <laughs> So what they do is they get a Makita out, all right, and they sit there and go zip, 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 and put all these little plates on, and they can stabilize these fractures much more rapidly than they could in the old days. So it's made a big difference in how people can uh, have their, their uh, facial fractures and other parts of the body. Uh, in the earlier uh, uh, session, I talked about how people were hospitalized for extended periods of time with broken bones. Nowadays, with fixation, whether it's internal fixation or external fixation, you can get patients out of the hospital and avoid a lot of the other uh, so-called morbidity that occurred from these extended hospitalizations. <coughs> now, speaking of evolution, we have two skulls here. The one on the left is a human. The one on the right is a gorilla. Now, we all know how violent gorillas are, right? I mean, they sit in the jungle and eat their berries and their other kinds of, of you know, uh, vegetative growth. Really, gorillas are not uh, carnivores. They don't eat much meat unless they're in a battle or something, or a male is trying to kill off the young to start his own new uh, uh, little city. But if you look at this, here's this big gorilla over here. Look at all the bone around his eyes. Here's his skull. You can't see it. I didn't quite get it all in the frame here. Look at this great big thing. It's like a keel. Remember the Thanksgiving turkey? It's got that big keel where all the, the breast muscles over here to, for the wings. Why would this this uh, gorilla have a keel on top of his head because he's got muscles that come down and move this massive jaw over here. So even if he did want to get into a fight, he's got a pretty good weapon over there, all right? So if you looked again more carefully, you'd see that the brain case for the brain of a gorilla is significantly smaller. Now we transform over to the human. Big brain case, big brain, small teeth, small mandible, no keel, all right? So we have evolved in this osteological evolution what about the brain? Well, I would suggest to you that if you visit any of the ERs around here on Friday and Saturday nights, sometimes known as the Knife and Gun Clubs, that we have not evolved. <laughs> we are still at this level over here, all right? We need that skeleton to protect ourselves. Unfortunately, it's a sad commentary on our behavior. You know, we've evolved in terms of our osteology, but our brain power is still lagging. All righty. Let's take a skull and look in the inside of it. And I always tell a medical student, it's, like, it's not like the bottom of a bucket where everything is nice and smooth. There's a big hole there. Some of you have heard of it, the foramen magnum, because this is a, it means a large window. Foramen is a, is a window. Magnum, obviously, magnum guns are big guns, so this is a big foramen. Um, and it's sort of set up here such that I call these Japanese terraces. You know, you've seen these Japanese gardens that are all terraced out with different things on different levels. If you look at this, you'll see that this particular terrace over here is higher than the next one, and then this one back here is even lower. We call these the cranial fossae. There's an anterior cranial fossa, a middle, and a posterior, and they're there to contain certain parts of the brain. There's also other holes here, foramen, if you will, which allow the other nerves to go out. The brain has 12 nerves, so the nerves that come from the, from the brain itself are called cranial nerves, and they all have a different function. So here's the brain. This is the cortex, this is the cerebellum, and this is what we call the brainstem. We can color that so we can say there's a frontal lobe and a parietal and a temporal lobe, so they're different parts and they have different functions that we uh, recognize. The cerebellum we don't worry too much about. It, it has an important function that's related to muscular coordination and injuries of this will cause problems with gait and movement of your limbs, etc. but uh, beyond that we don't really have any intellectual function there. The brainstem is the site of where most of our cranial nerves are passing out to do their things. So when we look at the brain over here, here's the whole brain, there's the cerebellum back over here, here is the brainstem. Now, you may have heard of the, something called the mesencephalon, the middle brain, the pons, which means the bridge. If you've been to, to Florence, you know the Ponte Vecchio, all right, the old bridge, all right. Well, this is the, the, the pons here for the brainstem. Then there's the medulla. Now, the medulla is actually oblong, so it's called the medulla oblongata, but we never say that. We just say the medulla. If you're in, on television, you might say that to impress people with your magnificent knowledge of, of anatomy. <laughs> so here we see frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital. Some of you may know that injuries at the back of the brain cause problems with visions, because this is where all the, uh, the retina of your eyes project. 
So when it gets back there and you have problems back there, there will be visual disturbances, if not frank blindness because of the injuries that occur there. Other areas of the brain, temporal, speech, and hearing. Uh, and then we mentioned over here a moment ago, big strips for motor and sensory. Uh, the, pre, uh, the strip out here in front is the motor one and the, and the post central is the sensory one so that there's big areas of cortex devoted to all these functions. Now what I want to do is I want to get back and say something more about the dura for a moment and um, tell you that the dura is not only a covering inside the brain but it also contains veins. Veins that are draining the brain. That's nice because it rhymes, right? It's easy to remember. I once asked a medical student what are the dural sinuses? He said, oh, well, there's the superior sagittal, and the C oh, there's a sigmoid. I said, never mind that. I said, why are they there? And he kept telling me the names of them, and I said, I don't want to know that. In three or four words, what is the function of the dural sinuses? He couldn't do it, and he was a senior. He'd come back to do a dissection because he was going off into a surgical uh, program. So I said, drain the brain. Drain the brain, all right? That's what they're there for. All that carotid blood that goes up there comes out through these. So now, when we say the meninges, we said the dura, the arachnoid. So I put over here, dura. And if there's a space above the dura or below the dura, we might give it a name. How about epidural or subdural, all right? Below the arachnoid, that's the subarachnoid. Its significance is the CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid is there. So if I look at one of these pictures over here, and now of an adult skull where we've made a cut, and look into that, there's one of these big dural veins. This is the bone, that's your scalp skin up there. And if you look down, you see this silver gray. That's dura. Then you see red. That's the arachnoid. So if I say to you, what is above the silver, you'd say bone. Ah, you're close to it, but sometimes there's blood there, okay? That means there might be blood in the epidural space, and blood sometimes is called an epidural hemorrhage or hematoma, so that could occur. What about below the dura? Well, a little bit of space here, so it's possible that we could have a subdural hematoma. If we have one that's... Uh, on the surface of the brain where we see some of these blood vessels, that blood would be in the subarachnoid space, which is the fluid space, and that could spread throughout the whole fluid space. So if you drew spinal fluid off of the patient, that would have blood within it. If you have bleeding below the pia inside the brain, that's bad. Right? Any intracerebral bleeds are bad. An epidural hemorrhage or a subdural hemorrhage, as I'm going to tell you about momentarily here, are such that they are bleeds of blood vessels into those spaces there is usually no specific injury to the brain. Therefore, if you can evacuate that clot, you save the patient because there's no underlying brain injury. That's best for a neurosurgeon. Most neurosurgeons cannot operate on the brain without leaving some morbidity behind. This is a dramatic instance. Now, because of the time, I'm gonna sort of speed up a little bit. We'll just whip right through some of these things. All right, and what I'm gonna do is say, all right, if we're, this is important, how do we get blood to the brain in the first place where this is going to be an issue? The carotid artery. I told the other group earlier, carotid means sleep, okay? And so you have two carotids that go to your skull. Uh, one is an external, it supplies the outside of your face over here, but the internal one goes inside the skull and is a major blood supply of the brain. So if you obstruct both carotids, you go to sleep, right? And if you keep it that way, you go to sleep for a long time. So uh, you don't want to do that. There is another artery over here that's called the vertebral artery because it runs inside part of the bony anatomy of the vertebral column and then crosses the backside here and goes to the foramen magnum. These two vertebral arteries join together to make what we call the base there because it lies against the base of the skull. There is a membrane right here, the dura, right, that was coming down. So when this artery goes through here to go inside the brain, it actually has to pierce the dura. And when it pierces the dura, it can't be leaky, right? You can't have CSF leaking out from the inside, so there's a tight seal there. That means the artery is anchored at that point. So if this guy is doing this and this, stretching his neck, and suddenly turns to his friend and says, I think I did something wrong, and collapses on the floor, what he did was he tore his vertebral artery, and he dies of a massive, uh, basically, stroke. You may remember in the newspapers here a while back, a young little girl was at the hockey game with her father, and this hockey puck hit her came off the ice, knocked her head sideways, and what it did was it tore her vertebral artery right here so that no intervention at that point in time by any surgeon was going to be able to do anything for her. Bad things happen, all right? And the anatomy in this case is what's involved. You can't always fix the anatomy, depending upon where it lies. Here you see the base of the brain with all these arteries there. 
I won't go into the trouble of naming all of them, uh, but there's a big circle here in which they all come together. It's called the Circle of Willis. Now, um, we make the students identify all these and put the, ask for the names and so forth, but we'll get past that. See, here it is right over there. You have to know all that stuff, but we're not going to take you there again. We're going to get out of that. And I won't name all the cranial nerves that are there, but what I'm going to do is come back and say, once we've seen some of the arteries, one of the ways that for years, now Dr. Beauchamp, is, he's, just, he's, he's going like this. We don't do that anymore, okay? But at one time, they used to put contrast, not dye, contrast into the carotid artery. And when they did so, you'd be able to see the carotid artery, and you'd actually be able to say, hey, that's the anterior cerebral, and this is the middle over here. And gee, I don't know what that artery is over there. I'm not sure. Might be a tube, but we'll, we'll worry about that later, okay? <laughs> So here we are, back at the skull. You see how these arteries are all, lay, all laid out? They supply very specific parts of the brain. This one right over here supplies down the middle. This supplies the surface. As it goes over here out onto the surface here, it's called the middle cerebral. These are very predictable and topographical areas. So if one of these arteries is obstructed, there's a reasonably predictable outcome for that patient to some degree. Now, with our new things where we can treat patients with, with clot busters, so to speak, um, at least if that is if they have a clot. If they have a bleed, that's another issue. But if they have a clot, we can prevent that. Here you see some very small vessels here going up. They go into the internal capsule that I told you about a moment ago. They are so small that even small clots can obstruct them and create minor areas of problems for the patient. All right, so now that we've done all that, let's come back and you see things happen, right? This guy did surprisingly well. I tried to figure out how, I won't, I won't waste your time, but the moral of this story is don't release the safeties on your pneumatic nail guns, okay? <laughs> you work faster, but it's, it doesn't work. So let's come back to somebody who's been traumatized. Level of consciousness, hemiparesis, eye signs, vital signs, and death. So here we go. Here is the skull. There is dura. We've taken the bone away, and on top of the dura is an artery. It's called the middle meningeal artery. Well, you could tie it off at birth and nothing would happen. It's not important, but it's there. If you now look at this artery, you say it can't be there. There's no space between the bone and the dura, right? Well, if you look on the other side over here, you'll see how during growth of the skull bones, it's actually a little bit of a ditch, so to speak, a little excavation where this artery lies in life, and then it's tightly bound down by the dura. Now, we've taken the bone away so you can see where that artery is sort of raised up, all right? So what do you suppose happens if you crack a little bone with an arcing fracture line that goes zip, 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 okay? You tear the artery. It may look hairline on the x-ray, but at the moment that happened, a big separation occurred. You've got a big bleed. Where is the bleed? It's between the bone and the dura. What kind of a bleed is it? Epidural, all right? This is an artery. Is the hematoma going to get big quickly or slowly? Very, very quickly, untreated, these patients, of, when this is significant, are dead in less than 24 hours, all right? This is, this is critical, all right? Now, what happens is, as this clot gets bigger and bigger, it pushes down on the brain, and it starts pushing and pushing until pretty soon part of the brain is going to be pushed down into the frame of magnum, as I'll show you in a moment, all right? Uh, some of these, if they are subdural, and as I'll show you again in a second here, if they are subdural, not epidural, they, because of the natural pathology here, they grow over time. So the moral to this story is epidurals get bigger quickly and cause death sooner. Subdurals uh, may last as long as four, six, maybe even eight weeks before they actually put enough pressure on the brain that the patients become symptomatic. So here we go. This is a lady. Uh, she was in her 70s. She hit her head on the windshield. Nothing happened. She felt fine. But about four weeks later, they noticed that she had a little mild seizure. She hadn't been herself lately. She was kind of a little bit slow, and she was speaking with a little bit of a slurred speech. So again, we did a nice little angiogram. Uh, and we look over here, and we see there's a problem in that the surface of the brain isn't going out to where the cortex is. Now, one of the things about this is that you should be there when these happen, because it's dynamic. People always hate showing uh, angiography as still images, because when you're there, it's in real time, and you're seeing all this happen. So if you are watching that artery, where's the blood going to go after it gets out of the artery? Into the capillaries. And now you see the, the sort of uh, curl, coiled area, not very well defined structurally, 
uh, of the capillaries, but you see that same space. And now you wait another minute or two or, so or less, and now that contrast is in the veins that are coming off here, going up to where these dural sinuses is. And now again, you can see the space. So it's clear this patient has a subdural, all right, uh, and she was uh, operated on, the clot was removed, and shortly thereafter, uh, she returned to normal function. Why? Because she had no brain injury, all right? She only had a clot. Here is the case of an epidural, as we see over here, which has now progressed to the point where, forget over here, where um, it's pushing the brain, and now it's actually projecting down so that this medial part of the brain is compressing the brain stem. The brain stem is where all your cranial nerves are that regulate your blood pressure. Remember we talked about these things of blood pressure, heart rate, breathing, all those kinds of things. This is all being compromised by pressure and by pressure on the blood vessels that supply those centers. This is the patient untreated who will be dead uh, very shortly. So my next door neighbor uh, is up in Alaska. And um, he's showing his, his uh, executive from uh, out of town around. And in the process of going from the hotel out to dinner, he slips and falls on the uh, parking lot, cracks his head, and gets in the car, and they go out to where they're going to have a drink before dinner. And so it um, turns out the man says, well, you guys go have a drink. I'm going to stay in the car. They came back, drove to another place where they had, uh, actually, they had a drink in the first place. The second was a, was a dinner. And he says, no, I don't want any dinner right now. You guys go and have dinner. So this is now probably about a good hour and a half or so, or better, after the accident. They're coming back to the hotel, and there are four of them all together. The executive is in the center, two of the other people are there, and my neighbor is walking behind them. And he looks down, and he sees that this guy is dragging his leg. Okay? Now, level of consciousness. Is he unconscious? He's uptunded. He's not quite with it. That's why I didn't want to get up and go, right? What's his, is he hemiparesis? Yes, he is. If you looked at his pupils, he probably would have been unequal, all right? And so my neighbor says, you know, I don't think we ought to go in there. I think we should take this guy to the hospital. And I said, now you've got a dilemma. I said, because in this city, at that time, there's no neurosurgeon there. But there was a general surgeon who was trained in the old-fashioned way, went through all the subspecialties. He did the burr hole, went in there, and fixed up his middle meningeal artery, and this patient survived because of the fact there was no brain injury. Now, that's not to say that every head injury is only an epidural or a subdural. Those that involve brain injury are obviously tragic things that are going to leave some significant uh, disability for the patients if the patient survives. But there's no reason for patients who have a, a hematoma not to be recognized and treated in a timely way. I mean, I can just go back through the newspapers around here that have, that have uh, told the stories of people who have died uh, because they had some head trauma. The lady who was here before who said her son died, now he probably also had intracerebral problems. Had he had only a epidural hemorrhage and treated early, that could have been taken care of. One of the cases here was a school kid who, was, uh, who fell at uh, one time and was taken to school nurse. His mother picked him up, took him home. Uh, she put him to bed. He got up at 10 o'clock at night to try to go out to go to the bathroom, collapsed in the hall, and was dead at 3 o'clock in the morning at Harborview. That was an epidural hemorrhage. He could have been saved. So what is the moral of this story here? Level of consciousness. If somebody is unconscious for any period of time, they probably should be on their way to the ER, all right? if they're showing signs of hemiparesis. Certainly, uh, the other part about eye signs. So you take your child home. He's hit his head playing something or another. He got hit in the head with baseball. He wants to lie down for a while. You wake him up in an hour. You look at him. Can you talk to me? Shine a little light in his eyes. You don't have a pin light. Use the bed lamp, whatever you've got. Look at the pupils. Are they equal or not? Take his arms. Pull on his arms and say, don't let me pull your arms away from you. If one side is weak, you want that boy to be, or child to be headed to the ER right then and there because a neurosurgeon is going to need to intervene in this. So that's anatomy. It's a lot of names. <laughs> but it all comes down to better care for all of us, and I hope that this has been of some help to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll stay Some right of now. you have to leave, but uh, we still, Dr. Graney, do you mind if they ask you a few questions? Yes. I have to tell you, he, he makes my hands almost sweaty now. I'm, are we going to be tested on this next week is all I work about. Come on up here, Dr. Graney. Yeah. Come up to the microphones, folks. Otherwise, if you have to go, thanks for an, another lovely evening. I would, like to, I would like to know how you donate your body to the University of Washington, what kind of papers you need to fill out before you die. 
Um, Besides that, your let me just go back knows. to my home page here. Yeah, here we go. Do you see this right here yeah. where it says biostir.washington.edu? Yep. If you go to that website, okay. you can download a donor form, you can get our information letter, and all of that is right there. Biostir.washington.edu. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. You can also write, uh, you can get my name from the web for the university. You could write to me and I'll forward it to the office. Go home and drive safe. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm.